that we should have uh, one speaker to cover uh, work in uh, the area of uh, animal science and the other speaker to work who has worked in the area of plant sciences. So on behalf of uh, the section committee 10 and on behalf of uh, INSA, uh, I am especially delighted to uh, host this session and welcome both of our invited speakers. You know, our session has something very special uh, across the two talks. In the first talk uh, by uh, Professor Chauhan uh, is related to uh, dairy animals, livestock, and uh, finally milk as an important product. And uh, the second talk uh, uh, is around uh, uh, increasing uh, crop yields, especially uh, cotton, you know, by taking care of insect pests. I mentioned this to say that something which is very common and uh, something that gives pride to the nation uh, is that in case of milk production, as well as in case of cotton production, our country is at the highest level globally. For example, in the area of milk, uh, we produce about uh, one fourth, nearly 25% of uh, global uh, milk. Similarly, in the area of cotton production, we are the highest competing uh, very closely with uh, China. In the area of milk production, we are followed by United States and, Ch and then China. In the area of cotton production, we are now followed by uh, China and then USA. You know, why I'm mentioning this is that in spite of having achieved so much, essentially because of uh, government support, government policies, uh, but uh, more importantly, because of contributions by our very distinguished uh, institutes and our inst distinguished uh, colleagues like uh, uh, two of them we have today with us. You know, but the effort must go on in spite of uh, high uh, production, as I said some time back, in both the cases, the productivity, that means the production per unit livestock or production uh, per hectare of crop, you know, still lags behind. And you know, we lag behind by two to three folds uh, as compared to the best uh, anywhere in the world. And I mentioned this to make a point that uh, therefore high science, continued investment in uh, good science, and extensive public outreach uh, is required for uh, the country to really make its mark uh, globally by increasing both productivity and eventually production obviously will increase, which already is uh, at the highest. You know, at this point, I will remind you of uh, uh, what the president uh, Insa yesterday in her concluding uh, uh, talk uh, mentioned. You know, she conducted uh, uh, a lecture uh, on communication in science. And she made a point yesterday uh, by uh, saying that uh, science has needs communication for public and also for uh, policy makers. She pressed upon the need to convert you know, what she called as faculty science, or we may call it as laboratory science to citizen science. And uh, that's where uh, and I would like to make a point that the two theme areas that we cover uh, in this session are one of the most fitting areas of science uh, fitting for uh, developing very strong outreach programs and uh, therefore i urge uh, our speakers both the speakers you know to consider uh, uh, what president insa uh, gave a call yesterday in terms of uh, preparing uh, some white papers on uh, making public and uh, policy makers aware of what is needed for continued science why continued investment and investments at a higher level are required and how public awareness needs to be built so that good science that we are doing you know, reaches uh, the land and its field applications. So with this, I will say it's my pleasure to invite uh, uh, Dr. M.S. Chauhan. I'll uh, very briefly uh, make a point that Professor Chauhan you know, is known uh, nationally and globally uh, for his work in reproductive biology of farm animals and uh, applications for uh, enhancing milk production particularly. Currently, he is vice chancellor at uh, a nationally known institute, National Dairy Research Institute, uh, which actually is a uh, deemed university and therefore he's a vice chancellor. He's also director of the institute and the institute, as you know, is located in Karnal. Before this, he used to work at the Central Institute for Research in Goat, uh, located in Mathura. You will hear from him 
a, a large amount of outstanding work that his group and the team that has been steering and participating and has been carrying out out of his excellent work he has uh, uh, been endowed with vasvik industrial award he has been endowed with the uh, rao bahadur vishwanathan award with the uh, rafi ahmed kidwai award with several awards and uh, award lectures from uh, icar for his outstanding work in assisted reproductive technologies so rest we'll hear from professor chohan and i uh, request him uh, to deliver his lecture which is entitled as enhancement of productivity of farm animals a journey from in vitro fertilization to animal cloning dr chohan please thank you very much okay thank you very much um, thank you uh, honorable chair professor rakesh tuli and all the eminent uh, scientists here uh, the, the fellowships of insa and thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, because uh, you know that and thank you also thank you to you that uh, inducting or electing the first uh, insa fellow from the farm animal side from the veterinary side from the animal science and uh, animal science in in case of flowers animal science is a farm animals like cattle buffalo all these things so here as you said that we have a limited time also around uh, i think i will speak around 40 minutes and so let me share my by the uh, uh, the slides I think uh, this one yeah Yeah, Dr. Chauhan, it is perfect. It, yeah. it, it, uh, it must be visible to you, sir. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Full. Yes, okay. So, uh, the topic, as it has been said, the announcement of the productivity of farm animals, uh, generally from IVF to animal cloning, and just to uh, to um, elaborate uh, this thing, because when I joined the NDRI in long back in 1987 after doing PhD from PA Ludhiana I came here and then I uh, that time it was a uh, issues that uh, what need to be done in terms of the announcement of the productivity and I will uh, let you know that what was the scenario but you know the scenario uh, that these uh, the uh, during uh, the after the um, Uh, the when we uh, we have a data of 1951 this uh, this uh, the what was the status of the milk production it was hardly 17 million tons and very uh, low yield and so this and then after words it was increased but not in peace substantially the reason behind was that we did not have a technology which can enhance the productivity of the our animals particularly the farm animals and if you see the livestock scenario uh, the so today we have a 302 million bovine bovine means in terms of bovine we talk about the cattle and buffalo we consider them bovine and also which is uh, contributing around 28% to agriculture economy uh, with the around 4.1% of the gba and this is a very recent uh, uh, economic so 2018 19 and current uh, milk production is over 200 million tons and what 200 because yesterday they were talking that 203 million tons but i just mentioned here it's over 200 million tons and indian uh, dairy industry is which is a very huge industry in terms of the uh, economics so you can see that over 107 uh, billion us dollar and so uh, the uh, the again but the the because the, at the same time we have a population huge population growing and where the demand of milk is and meat is again growing and what we expect that by 2050 we need to double this and this is the which will be increased around 50% as we are getting today as, uh, like in uh, as compared to this the biggest problem what we have is the low uh, productive with high population and this is the everywhere you can see that 
when you are talking this uh, the the animal health and uh, also the animal population in india so everywhere you can see the animals are roaming and this is the biggest problem of what we are facing today and what the limitation we have is like the we have a less population of high milk yielding animals so therefore uh, because when i joined we are in 87 so we have initiated some of the work that can we have a assisted reproductive technology which was initially just restricted to artificial insemination can we have enhanced the productivity of the animals by using other uh, techniques which was probably established in case of the human being and mice but can we use that here in buffalo or our indigenous cattle so this was the this was the uh, this was the talk and then we uh, took this challenge and because of this because uh, because a large population and once you announce the uh, replace the uh, the poor quality animals so it is going to reduce the input in terms of feed and fodder in terms of housing and also management and also furthermore the animal health so this is the just overall scenario in front of you i will touch uh, like all the part uh, here in 40 minutes talk there uh, like we initially we had a natural breeding and by 2060 we had a mainly focusing on natural breeding but in 2065 onwards we had initiated the work on artificial insemination and that time it was only 5% then when in 80 87 it was hardly 50 uh, 15% so this is the first generation like the this uh, the artificial insemination we we uh, consider the first generation technology in terms of the uh, the enhancement of the productivity of, uh, through the assisted reproductive technology and then then second subsequently uh, this the second generation uh, this was the embryo transfer technology where we were using the single ovulation embryo transfer and also the multiple ovulation embryo transfer and then subsequently, we, like the ovum pickup, with this uh, lately we have initiated the work on the, which was the third generation ovum pickup and IVF, and then also the fourth generation. Uh, today, we are working in the area of stem cell technology and animal cloning. So my focus will be mainly on the artificial insemination. Uh, why we want to increase this, and in order to do that, all the assisted reproductive technology like ovum pickup and animal cloning, these will be my focus initially. Uh, what we, but just just in terms of the giving this overall scenario, you can see that artificial insemination, which was initially in 2001, hardly covering the 19 million population of our bovine cattle and buffalo and today what you can see that it went to around 78 million but in 2017 the data says that which is available to the national dairy development board it was in 73 uh, this million population but if you see in terms of the per capita availability which was increased substantially you can see that 270 to 375 and today it has uh, went up to 412 gram per day per person and this is the because of this is why it is it is because of the just only by using the artificial insemination and today we are covering 30 percent of ai and we are projecting 2025 by using the assisted reproductive technologies like uh, embryo transfer technology, ovum pickup, and then cloning, we expect that it will increase uh, up to 60%. Uh, so you can see that once it increases, uh, definitely milk uh, production and meat production will be increased. This is the just uh, like AI is very, very important. And this has been given in front of you because we know that most of you uh, are from the either basic science or the fundamental science. But here, this as far as this animal and veterinary science is concerned, you can see that this scenario here, number of EI performed in terms of the, the thousands, and you can see that 
8.29 crore AI was uh, expected in 2020-21. Still, we are looking for the data, which will be released shortly by the Department of Animal Husbandry and Government of India. But you see that we have to, uh, we need to have a more uh, AI performance, and for that we need to have a quality bull and quality animals. So therefore, the work which has been initiated by us uh, uh, in uh, early 90s, it was uh, on IBF initially, we were obtaining the, uh, because uh, nothing was known, and particularly what I'm going to let you know that the only, uh, the India has a large number of buffalo population. So, the, so therefore, the buffalo is our very important animals, and only India, only we, we have to work on buffalo. So therefore, is, this is the this is just scenario in front of you that uh, in terms of contribution of milk percentage of different from different animals, and you can see that around 53.37 percent is being uh, produced by the buffalo, and rest of the all the goat three three percent around three percent then non descriptive uh, cattle around 20 percent and crossbred animals around uh, this are uh, 22 percent. So this is the scenario what we have today. And therefore, our focus was mainly on Buffalo. And Buffalo, when we were initiated this work, uh, there was a difficulty in terms of growing the embryos in vitro by using the uh, established um, uh, the, the IBF system in case of cattle. But what we have learned over a period that uh, the IBF is species specific. The protocol which is required uh, for the for in case of buffalo is different There's than the in case, available in case of the cattle. So initially we struggled a lot. We struggled in terms of developing to four to eight cell states in during the 90s, and then again changing many things in protocol systems, using the different media, culture conditions, additives, and so many things, and then we were able to produce the blastocysts, uh, which was very frequently around 40% in 2005. So a lot of things were there. There was uh, many things uh, in terms of changing this, uh, the block, which was here, then from here to up to Morula and from Morula to blastocysts. And why blastocysts required that at this moment, at this time, we use the blastocysts for embryo transfer. Before this, if you utilize the Morula, sometimes you get the fragmented shells and then you once you embryo transfer this you will not get the calf so this was the so therefore we our aim is to develop the blastocysts however in case of human being you are satisfied with the four cell stage only so at this stage in case of human being you will go for embryo transfer you will go for transferring to the recipient female but in case of the large animals and particularly in case of buffalo and cattle here you have to have the blastocyst. So it means that another eight days you have to culture your system in vitro. And for that, you require the very proper energy source, serum, growth factors, and so many other things like antioxidants and so many things. So here, so this is the one example when we were initially there, we were struggling. This is one example where we have a, uh, the the oocytes with the cumulus cells which cover the oocytes and these cumulus cells support the development of the oocytes in mature oocytes to become a mature one. So this is once you have a cumulus cell supported oocytes, so when we inseminated them in IVF, so we hardly could get around 7% morula and only 0.5, uh, uh, just 7% the blastocyst. But what we have done is we have very systematically each and everything we were uh, putting the culture like that it is available in case of the in vivo system. So what we have we thought that let us use the obedical cells epithelial cells from the slaughterhouse material, and we have done this and just using the obedical cells this was the morula blastocyst was increased drastically you can see significantly. 33% and then you can see the box is production was 8%. So it means that just, and our focus was also here that, because we want to have a very, very easiest or 
very uh, easy going protocol. Ultimately, you are going to utilize them in a state government farm or then in a nuclear farm where you have to use the, you, you have to multiply the quality animals. So therefore, our focus is always to simplify our protocol. And this was the one of the simplification. And also what we have seen this uh, development in terms of the all these things by using the different quality media. We have a MCR2 media, we have a synthetic obesitable fluid. We have developed the, this media which was supplemented with the TCM199, supplemented with the uh, fetal bovine serum and buffalo obeductal epithelial cells and these type of media. So we have done uh, many, many trials and what we have observed is very simple media which is uh, really useful to us. MCR2 with the fetal, uh, fetal bovine serum and also uh, where you can see the synthetic obeductal fluid. So these both media are working well. So this is the, uh, this is the, now today with the help of this media, we were able to produce 40% blastocysts. So it means that if you give me 100 homicide, I will give you back around 40 the blastocysts. So this was a remarkable achievement which has been done here. These are the initial data which were, we were struggling in terms of developing to two cell stage, four cell stage, and then early blastocyte development. And all these things now, how many, how many times, how much days it will take to develop to the blastocyte stage. So all these things so we have uh, standardized and then subsequently rather optimized. So we were getting now, we are getting now the very frequently the hatch blastocysts. And these are the hatch blastocysts after when you have a blastocyst, you, you culture them further in order to see that whether they are developing or not. So you should have a hatch blastocyst. These are the number of hatch blastocysts. But again, limitations also there in sometimes you have a lesser number of the blastocyst cells you can see here, but this is a fairly good amount of the cells, tropectodermal cells, inner cell mass cells. And these are the blastocysts being produced routinely in our laboratory. Of course, we went for embryo transfer and several calves have been produced by us uh, at NDRI. So the, the, this was the particularly in case of buffalo, but again, the limitations in case of the cattle was that you cannot slaughter the cattle because of the religious reasons. But what we have done is we have initiated work, uh, open pickup here in India. And then, so initially it was very difficult. So this is the one example when we have this cow, which was the eight lactation and now she was not saving further. So we have applied this cow for open pickup and after using all the oocytes obtained from this uh, cow by using the ultrasound guided needle and then we could able to produce the blastocysts, three, four blastocysts which was produced and then it was subsequently embryo transferred. And this holy uh, calf was uh, produced. Subsequently, it was extended to the uh, the Yak, uh, the Yak and National National Research Center on Yak, the Arunachal Pradesh. And this Norgal was calf was also produced uh, from the Yak by using the open pickup technology. So this is the very initial work which has been done by us in 2010 and where the uh, holy was uh, produced. So this was from the live animals, the number of follicles which are punctured and developed to the oocytes recovered, which was uh, then from these number of oocytes, it was the culturable oocytes, the quality oocytes, 39. And then from there, the 17% of the blue was developed, which was subsequently embryo transferred and the holy, the holy was produced holy name was given because she was born on the 7th uh, March uh, on the day of Holi. The uh, technology thank which you, was thank again... You, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Sir, so, so, then, then again, this, uh, this was uh, the progress well, and this uh, you can see that now this uh, is being implemented in many part of the... Uh, so, the, of the country and now we were able to produce uh, now this is one example from Uttarakhand Livestock Development Board. Sir, we have another uh, 10 years now. 
and then then you can see that the uh, in terms of the carb down if, uh, if uh, here this is the very recently i got this observation from dr uh, aswal and here the, now we have a number of embryos lying with us in vitro so what we are trying to use these embryos for embryonic stem cells and this is a very good uh, example here in case of you can see that mouse embryo where you can have in the cell mass cells. But in case of buffalo, it again become a difficult to locate the inner cell mass cells because of the high lipid content, uh, contents in case of the buffalo. So what we have uh, uh, done, we have isolated the, we have standardized the protocol here where the, from the inner cell mass cells, we were again culture the cells uh, from the inner cell mass cells subsequently made several passages by using the very uh, uh, the specific media and by doing many uh, combinations many additives and then we were able to develop the pluripotent type of cells uh, which was naturally this so many work which was uh, initiated in terms of the their uh, pluripotency maintenance by using the lif fgf bm P4 and TGF and so many things like uh, intrinsic and intrinsic factors which are responsible for pluripotent maintenance. So these are the uh, these are the some of the observations which is here uh, uh, where in terms of uh, by seeing them whether all the pluripotent markers are um, uh, are showing by them or not. So you can see that all the surface markers, also the marker markers, is that. Also, we have tried to differentiate them to the neurons like type of cells or some of the cells which are looking at, at like uh, uh, the, 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 the fibroblast type of cells. So these are the cells which was uh, grown well here. So right now we have uh, five uh, embryonic stem cell lines available in case of buffalo. And we offer to these cell science anybody who was willing to work on the Indonesian stem cells from the buffalo. So what we have done is we, in order to see that whether pluripotency of these cells are there, we have utilized these cells by using the hand guided cloning, which was established by us. I will elaborate that more here. And we were able to produce the Say so the um, Garima 2, which was the second clone calf uh, in 2009 uh, by us. So it means that the cells which are grown by us in vitro are pluripotent in nature, and these stem cells can be utilized for the subsequent uh, the cloning and also for the transgenic animal production. So these are the some of the expression of these cells where we have used the uh, GFP protein to see that whether transfection is there or not. And by, by using the handmade cloning, we were able to produce the blastocysts. Some of the blastocysts were utilized for embryo transplant. But today, till date, we did not get any transgenic animal, a transgenic calf. But we are working in this direction and hopefully in future we will get it. So these are the, uh, beside this, what we have tried now, because the, some of the work which is uh, required to be done in terms of whether these cells can be generated to the germ cells. And this was the experiment which was uh, um, uh, conducted by us and where we were able to produce the sum of the cells, two cell-like cells and four cell stage embryos and eight cell stage embryos and of course the blastocysts and so it means that by using the all the all the uh, the uh, the uh, the expression like using the retonic acid here in case of this, we were able to develop the uh, the blastocysts and this is the in terms of just to understand the behavior of the stem cells, whether you can differentiate them to the particular type of lineage or particular type of cells. So this is the one example in front of you. And also we have done further this, whether these cells are having a, the germ cells marker expressions, all the markers like in terms of the nanom, octopod, dagel, vasa, and all markers we have seen that they are expressing. Here you can see the very, very healthy type of blastocysts which was obtained from the embryonic stem cells. 
now the uh, this uh, because uh, this uh, Anet, uh, our our aim is to enhance the productivity so we were have initiated the animal cloning so the animal cloning why we need animal uh, this uh, the cloning as it has been said that we have a very few numbers of the quality animals and uh, quality in terms of the high high pedigree for animals which is going to produce uh, the high milk uh, production so therefore here this is the one uh, example here as it has been said that today we have a 30 percent ai uh, coverage which is uh, covering only 99 million of the animals and then 50 percent if you want to cover so you need to have a uh, 166 million demand of those must be 166 million doses and in order to go for the 100 percent ai we need to have a 332 million doses and that is uh, there but what the limitations what we have is total breeding bulls we have uh, hardly over 2500 bulls available to us and what is which is going to produce only 88 million doses but what we required is if you want to have a 50 percent ei coverage to your animals so you need to have a 166 you have to you have to double it so it means that you have to you must have a double number of the bulls quality bulls and which cannot be possible by the routine uh, breeding program so therefore the the one of the uh, important aspect here is uh, uh, method is the um, the cloning where you can multiply faster rate and you can get the quality bulls this is just one the procedure the procedure which has been developed by us here you can see the well met group who, who has produced the dolly and this where they have used the micro manipulator system in our case we have just uh, avoid this and we use a very small blade where we have utilized the small blade cut the the mature wool sides and then after this we have used the only dummy who sets here where without the uh, nucleus because once the prostitution of the first polar body you can find just near to this uh, the metaphase plate and you can reduce them you can avoid them and then only you can take the who set having a wood plasm or cytoplasm and this uh, the nucleus you can remove it we have done this from the slaughterhouse who sites and then subsequently we have taken the cells from the somatic cells which was culture and from there it was uh, in between the two dummy uh, dummy plug we put the cells here and we must to, uh, together by using the uh, small electric pulse fusion and then it was merged together and developed to the blastocyst which was subsequently transferred and number of calves was the produced so here what we have is by uh, this avoiding the 35 lakhs equipment macro manipulator system, we have utilized a small blade which costs you around two rupees only. So this is a, what achievement or what we call is handmade cloning or hand guided cloning. So this is because of two hand and this is the one poster which is everywhere. Like this is the donor was well, initially which was obtained the cells. So we culture the cells, somatic cells. We took one cells between the two dummy oocytes we put together, we constructed the embryos and then developed the embryos to the blastocyst stage, implanted to the, um, uh, the surrogate mother and developed the clone calf. And this was the first clone calf. And actually this was appeared in, in, in 2010 in KBC program. And this was the 50 lakhs questions and this fellow uh, this, uh, won this, uh, this award. This, uh, this is uh, after doing this, there was a one just uh, have a look once that we were satisfied with the work initially. And what we have received the mail from the US, my uh, professor, Professor Guardas was there. He sent me immediately the New York City news and where it has been mentioned that Indian scientists own world first buffalo calf. So this was the little satisfaction to the scientists who are working here our team there are many uh, factors which are influencing the the cloning so this uh, i will uh, because uh, the the paucity of time 
but the, 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 these are the um, uh, this uh, uh, the uh, important factor is somatic self factor and also the technical factors your skillness and many things are different. also the oocyte quality and then electric pulse and all these things whatever culture condition all these things and we have done all these uh, the, uh, the, the the work and where we have seen the very important thing is epigenetic uh, uh, modifications are playing a very very important role and where we have taken the different type of cells also and which cells is beneficial what we have obtained the cells which were, which you are getting from the either the stem cells and from the near to the oocyte that is the equimodal cells is going to give the high rate of the blastocyst production. So um, many many factors we have uh, done, but what we have seen that DNA methylation pattern also, and which is also very very important. We have compared the IBF embryos with the clone embryos. And there was there we saw that those factors are very very important, and which is ultimately triggering or reducing the uh, the pluripotency of uh, markers uh, the genes. And so uh, the, these uh, so anyway, but uh, we were able to uh, develop now is around 30 to 40 percent blastocysts and which were subsequently uh, utilized for the embryo transfer number of calves have been produced. But limitation, what we are getting is here that sometimes because of the not proper uh, the culturing or sometimes uh, the not proper reprogramming, the stillbirth we have obtained and these are the stillbirth which was uh, very like the both was a clone from the same animal. And it was because it was uh, two uh, embryos were uh, transferred to a recipient animal. These two uh, still but, uh, were there. So means that it was initially very difficult to establish the 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 the, the cloning technology uh, at NDRI. So we have struggled a lot. We have seen all the parameters and combination, all these things what we have seen by using the different media, MCR2, SOR, RBCL media. And through this, you can see this development of the cloned blastocysts. You can see that, and here we have counted the cells also because the trophodermal cells and the inner cell mass cells. You can see that the ratio should be suitable in order to get normal calf. And again, the limitations with by developing the clone embryos, you can see that some of the embryos are restricting in the small cell size. And therefore, this is and once uh, when we applied these cells where the, the the combination was not suitable, so we saw the large calf syndrome. It means that uh, so this is the again this uh, it was the challenge to us and we went further where we have seen this uh, this cell balance or cell between the trophodermal cells and the inner cell mass cells. And you can see that the trophodermal cells are high in number as compared to the inner cell mass cells. So it means that you need to have a different culture conditions where the these uh, the embryos, the healthy embryos, should be uh, produced. So what we have initiated, we have uh, seen that what is what are the reasons. So we have seen this. It is because of the trophodermal cells, which is uh, very, very important. And despite being successfully used to produce live of, of offspring in many species, also in case of uh, the buffalo, the somatic cell nuclear transfer has had a limited applicability due to the very low live birth and due to the because of the high uh, calf, large calf syndrome and then high incidence of the pregnancy failure. So we have uh, done a study here that what could be the reasons and what we have seen that some of the uh, the, the gene which was responsible for developmental gene and uh, was uh, low in case of the uh, the clone embryo as compared to the IBF embryos. So then we have done number of uh, gene uh, this uh, uh, evolution and we saw that again also the methylation pattern. Uh, of the S3K9AC and S3K uh, uh, 
27 of the donor cells has a different type of the differentiation or the uh, gene uh, pattern and this is also this uh, because of this thing we have changed our protocol we have changed our additives and medium and now we are uh, having a very normal uh, uh, the clone animals uh, with, uh, which was being which is being uh, produced by us here at NDRA. So this is and beside this what we have done is we have taken these cells from the different uh, origin. This is the one example in front of you where they, we have taken the cells from the urine and then this uh, this uh, animal which was uh, uh, from the urine it was it was produced because uh, sometimes you don't have a jump arm sometimes you are not able to get this uh, the cells from the high pedigree animals so you have a urine from urine you can isolate the 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 cells and you can produce the the clone embryos. A apart from this, the other work which has been established by us, like in terms of the restoration of the dead valuable bull uh, semen, uh, bull uh, somatic shells. So there was one example, we had a, one bull which was a high pedigree bull and we, once you use the semen of this bull, the, uh, the female which will come into uh, the lactation, they will able to do 16 kg milk per day. So this was a very valuable uh, bull which was died 10 years before. What we have done is we have taken the only uh, the, the somatic cells from these bulls and then subsequently uh, these somatic cells was uh, semen from semen. We have thrown away the, the sperm but took only somatic cells which was culture and this uh, then used for the cloning and this uh, rajat calf was produced and this calf is now is adult here and uh, giving the quality semen the other thing what uh, the advantage of the cloning is there is the one example in front of you where we have used the conservations of uh, the uh, the uh, the wild buffalo which was available with the Chhattisgarh. This was the only female it was uh, available with them and she was only producing male, not female. So then wildlife uh, uh, people approach us and then they gave us some of the funding to us and we could able to produce from this Asa, the Pasa, which was then given to them uh, now and this female calf is, they are growing well and probably uh, they must be producing offspring. I will inquire it from them. So in this way, you can have a, a conserve the endangered species uh, here, which have been. So therefore, here in at NDRI, number of calves have been produced. And now today, we have a 24 live calves which has been produced. And here, this was further extended to the, uh, to this year, uh, this, uh, Central Institute for Research on Buffalo, and where from one single bull, they were able to produce seven calves. And this is the one example, and now this technology went to the farmers who are so, uh, so, so this is the one establishment, what uh, this is the overall just sort uh, the, the work which has been done uh, by, uh, by us, uh, by our team here. So what we can say that assisted reproductive technologies uh, have a great potential to enhance the productivity of, of uh, our animals, so many food. And today, we, uh, of course, they are limited to lab and nuclear farm. But tomorrow, we are expecting that it is going to be uh, used in field in, to the farmers do a step. And also, the more research is required, more fundamental, basic, and applied research is required. Uh, today, we have a three laboratories working. But in open pickup and IVF, there are 30 laboratories which are using our protocol, working in a different uh, across the uh, states here. And then probably so then they will uh, definitely is going to enhance the uh, the milk production. And India has one of the highest growth of the artificial uh, this uh, the assisted reproductive technology uh, center and. As I said, 30 more centers was established by Department of Animal Assembly, Government of India. We are supporting them for providing them uh, the training and also the know-how. 
and very soon india will be the leader uh, in terms of the art uh, of, of having a number of uh, uh, the the oocytes and embryos and which will be subsequently tried for embryo transfer uh, this is the team because uh, the in large animals while handling even a single buffalo you need a four animals four 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 men power to handle the buffalo so it's not like a mice or a small rodents or where you can handle easily and therefore the team work is required here so we were fortunate that we had a very good uh, strengths and uh, technician and the also the team dr singla dr palta and dr mani and also the currently we have a uh, very good team dr uh, naresh lokar and also the dr manoj kumar singh who are looking this this aspect and thank you for your kind attention and thank you once again to uh, the 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 president of the insa for electing uh, me as a fellow chief of the insa and thank you uh, to chair and thank you all of you well thank you thank you dr chohan for giving a lucid presentation of very impactful work that has been done uh, by your team and uh, and you personally uh, i i guess you would uh, be happy to address a few questions that uh, our participants yeah sure sure. sure sure so sure. i i we do okay. not have a lot of time uh, since the time in uh, these kind of meetings is limited uh, do participants have any question to ask although dr, I dr. Not... chauhan yes sir very, very nice very nice lecture so i just want to know uh, uh, is it it will be very difficult to collect the ovum pick up from buffalo compared to cattle how you do it actually yeah actually the in case of buffalo the limitation is that uh, we have uh, only few uh, follicles available on uh, on the ovary and the another limitation in case of buffalo is we have uh, embedded follicles so while while uh, like the looking through the uh, ultrasonography and then uh, putting the needle inside sometimes it, you miss the actual follicles because of the follicles are embedded so therefore this become a little difficult but once you have a expertise definitely you can have a oocytes from the live animals and we have tried here also but uh, the the uh, the the oocyte collection is fairly low as compared to the cattle uh, can can it be uh, you know induced artificially after collecting the follicles uh, yeah sure you can do that you can do by using the fsh hormones you can trigger the ovary you can you can have a number of follicles on ovary and then from that you can have a oocytes but again once if you are doing again hormonal injection so instead of doing this thing you can go for simply the normal uh, flushing of the embryos and using for those embryos for embryo transfer so what i we believe that instead of using the hormones exogenous hormones you just handle the buffalo properly you take these those buffalo where the, you can see the visualize uh, uh, the, the the follicles and then you can you know, use them for the ovum pickup and ivf thank you very much thank you very much I, I don't know how to how to close this it's not coming down yeah. see i i do not uh, i have a message that there are no questions on uh, youtube if our audience does not have uh, any other questions you know may i ask dr chauhan uh, a relatively naive question since you are working on uh, artificial insemination and uh, in vitro uh, cloning are there any methods developing to control the sex of uh, uh, calf to be born yes sure sir because uh, now this uh, the sexing of uh, sperm is going on and uh, what we uh, because already the techniques are available and uh, the but uh, we are looking forward to have our our indigenous uh, technique because for the, the the there are three four companies they are providing us the sex semen and if you are using the sex semen suppose you want to have a female calf so you have to have a xx uh, sperm and if you want to have a male calf you can have a xy sperm so definitely you can control the 
So sex. is it is this being done at NDRI or at other institutes in India? We we have a, we have a one program going on, but what we are looking to have our own technique okay. because the technique which is already available, of course, is being utilized in in India and across the states. But what we are looking forward to have our own indigenous so that we can provide to the uh, to the uh, the cheap type of uh, the low cost. Uh, technique to the farmers, uh, to our poor farmers. You mean, you mean the techniques are... Uh, uh, yeah, techniques are already there. Techniques are already there. No, but they, are they protected by patents and do they apply equally well yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, they are protected by patents, sir. So this okay. is the limitation. So we are going to develop our own... So my last question uh, is uh, just uh, intriguing whether you know, between the potential of uh, livestock, you know, for example, uh, the yield, the productivity yields, as you also mentioned, are fairly low in India as compared to the best. These may be uh, twofold, threefold, easily uh, different. So towards increasing uh, potential of our uh, indigenous cow or our cross hybrids, you know, are there any major leads available? You mentioned about epigenetics. You mentioned multiple things which you are handling. Yes, yeah, actually, the, these are these are the some of the basic fundamental research because while handling the uh, oocytes and embryo and cells outside, so yeah. you because what we are doing is we are playing with the live uh, cells, and not only for one day or two days, up to eight days, in CO2 incubator we are keeping away and doing all these things and then observing or evaluating them under the. Uh, microscope so sometimes because of the light, light or handling so it changes the behavior change also the culture conditions very very important and they also definitely is going to change the scenario of the gene expression there so those those things are there and definitely so these and beside this the epigenetic uh, these uh, uh, regulations or parameters are there which is going to affect uh, ultimately the development of the embryos and development of the cars. So these thank are the some of the limitations yeah. with us. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Chauhan, for giving an excellent exposition. And uh, uh, we move uh, forward uh, with a reminder: if you would like yes. to develop a white paper for INSA, you know, in this area, uh, and consider writing on improving productivity of dairy cattle through yes, and yes. investments in science, better management and uh, genetic potential of farm animals, you know, so papers on individual themes in the area of livestock and dairy management. Thank you yes, very much. Sir, with sir, that sir. On, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. On behalf of our sexual committee, on behalf of INSA, all of us, thank you. And I, 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 I yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The best thank you. Thank you. So with that, I move uh, to our uh, second speaker, Dr. P.K. Singh. Uh, so we, we I, on behalf of uh, our sexual committee and on behalf of INSA, I now welcome Dr. P.K. Singh, who is uh, with us. And Dr. P.K. Singh, you may put on your audio, you may put on your video. And uh, meanwhile, uh, and I would just make one remark, you know, that the work in the area of GM crops has uh, its own uh, experiences. And uh, this area of taking science or genetic engineering to farm has been experiencing you know what can be called as a roller coaster ride through the last 20 years and more in india since the release of bt cotton following the large scale adoption of bt cotton in 2002 india though we increased our production by two to three fold uh, and presently as i said earlier the production of uh, cotton in india is the highest in the world we are very closely china is very closely competing with us and after that is USA. Now, there are two types of problems uh, uh, that have been uh, experienced in uh, uh, bringing these technologies out uh, uh, in societal interest. You know, one major area of difficulty is faced because of misinformation, inadequate uh, information or information dissemination, and inadequate data availability. You know, hence, uh, once again, I request Dr. P.K. Singh also to consider playing his part uh, in uh, enhancing public outreach, outreach. Maybe we uh, decide to develop some white papers based on experiences of the roller coaster ride, if I may say, in GM crops that have been uh, faced in Indian agriculture. 
the second major area of uh, difficulty in uh, taking this science forward has been uh, uh, that researchers uh, find solutions to specific problems you know however nature throws newer and more problems and uh, that's why our uh, uh, our scientists have to uh, are then faced with new problems they have to find new solutions they have to be continuously uh, innovative and creative and thus good science is continuously required in case of uh, BT cotton, as you know, for about uh, 15 years, and the story went on well. But after that, we started having difficulties related to emergence of new pests or rather uh, uh, emergence of pests which earlier were minor uh, in terms of uh, uh, loss to yield and growth and uh, you know, in terms of uh, development of resistance. And uh, uh, you know, therefore, uh, creativity had to go on during my early days at National Botanical Research Institute. I was fortunate that Dr. P. K. Singh spent uh, a few of his early uh, PhD research uh, with me, and we developed BT cotton. However, uh, you know, as I said, uh, when it was left behind in the uh, struggle between uh, nature and uh, and and our uh, uh, laboratory science, and uh, and thus new solutions had to be found. You know, with this. Uh, I would only say that Dr. P. K. Singh uh, uh, is uh, first in the country to develop uh, uh, genes, design genes, synthesize genes, uh, uh, identify totally new, previously unknown uh, genes uh, to solve new problems and in new ways. He has mentored several PhD students, published a number of research papers. One of the most noteworthy of his works was published in Nature Biotechnology. This is perhaps the only research a paper which is based on uh, completely uh, science of Indian origin and therefore I congratulate Dr. P. K. Singh and invite him uh, to give his uh, talk which is entitled as a combat with a tiny insect but a mighty pest. Dr. P. K. Singh, please, please go ahead. Unmute thank you very much, sir. And put on your video. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. You are not visible as of now. Yes, sir, you are sir, audible. I my computer actually has stopped functioning so i'm working with another computer which hasn't camera uh, okay, but okay. No, fine, i fine will you. be able to make a presentation yeah, yeah. So go ahead go ahead please. i, I yeah. thank uh, insa council for inducting me as a fellow uh, i'm i'm going to share uh, uh, these my slides just a minute Let's call Sumit Bhag. What happened? You are trying to share. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure able out. To share? I, I'm just trying. Share. First, try to open your slides on the desktop and then um, click on the share button with an up arrow. Uh, it is an Apple computer and it is a little troubling me. Open your PPT, open your presentation on the screen first. Just a minute, we are, we are trying to fix out.
Can we have another computer? Can we connect here? अरे पीके भाई कोई डेस्कटॉप ले लो विंडोज वाला आई एम ट्राइंग आई एम ट्राइंग सर Sir, are you able to share? Or, or else you may share with the Insa and then they can present. Professor Singh, are you there? सर आर यू एबल टू शेयर वी आर फेसिंग Just open your slide on the desktop and then uh, click on the share option with an up arrow on the Webex window. Actually, I am using an Apple computer and it has it is not allowing. Dr. P. K. Singh, you can quickly share to Insa host, then they can uh, project for you. Or so you can send it to Insa, then we can share it from this side. That will be much easier, Dr. P. K. Singh. Okay. Yeah, I'll go there. Don't mail it. इंसान का इसमें होगा ना वो कहाँ गया सो काइंडली सेंड इट ऑन काउंसिल इंसान वी आर वी आर सेंडिंग ये रिप्लाई इंसान ओके इंसान का इसमें से नहीं काउंसिल इंसान इस पे डालो पहला वाला ना इन सब फेलोस है सर लिस्ट है नहीं नहीं इस पे डालो ना फ्रॉम सर उसका ये ईमेल एड्रेस है जहाँ से हमें आया है यहीं से आया सर यहीं से आया है डालो सो तो पी कैसे यू में Read out the address to which you are posting your slides, and post these from Gmail, not Hotmail. तो आपने वहाँ से करा सकते हैं। It may be a big file, so it may work better on Gmail. System, हाँ? So have you sent it? प्रोफेसर सिंह हैव यू सेंट योर स्लाइड्स अरे इंसान पेज ही नहीं खुल रहा है यहाँ पे आए यहाँ पे भी नहीं है यहाँ पे प्रेफरेंस ये मैकबुक के लिए तो भाई तो पता ही नहीं है वो सिस्टम प्रेफरेंस मांग रहा है सिस्टम प्रेफरेंस मांग रहा है एमएसटी मगर को पहले दे रखा है इसको भी मैंने दिया प्रेफरेंस 
जैसे ये गए सेंड इट टू मी लैपटॉप विच is not apple yeah yeah because he has made it all in mac na sir so now it is uh, only the pdf will be a safer version i think so see you got uh, okay you can also good to good to share this uh, you know ppt or a pdf before itself to the to the committee so that they this can yeah. be a little bit solved as Okay, a lot of us have experienced this difficulty when we work with Apple, and therefore mm. this should be handled in advance. Uh, That's what if if they can share it to the you know council yeah. before itself, then it will be a little bit easier, so that they can, we can take a quick decision.
Yeah. Uh, say again. It should reach, it should reach. Uh, Am I audible? Yes, you are, yes, you are audible. You can go ahead if you are ready. Yes, you can see the slide now being hosted by Insa. Yeah. Dr. Singh, you may unshare your slide. We are sharing oh. from you. Or are you sharing? Hello? You Hello? stop sharing? We are sharing actually, so you can directly speak. Yeah, we are, we are sharing. There is an internet connectivity mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Sir, we can see that there is some internet connectivity issue at your end, sir. Uh, you need to unshare it, please. Dr. Singh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, now the slides being shared by INSA Council are visible. So if yes. Dr. Speaker Singh is connected. No, but, uh, Dr. Singh is not, uh, I think, uh, connected right now, sir. We can see that there is some connectivity issue at his end. Uh, Uh, Dr. Singh, hello. Can you give a phone call okay. or uh, Dr. Manoj? Can, can you, you give a phone call? Sir, I have already called him and asked him not to share from his side. Insa is now, sharing. Now, what is the problem? Now we can see slide uh, being projected by Insta Council. So, uh, is no, it, no, is now, it... now he is answering and now he will speak. Okay. Yeah, you just start. We have already shared it, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You start. Yeah, you are sharing the slide. You just keep on talking. Yeah. Okay. And so let us know when to shift to the next slide. Yeah. We will do. Connectivity Next slide. Connectivity. 
connectivity issue. Yeah, is it due to low yeah. bandwidth? That's right. Bandwidth issue is that. Begin. Switch off your video and speak. Okay. So uh, the I start with a question. Internet, uh, Internet connectivity. Are you working on your institutional Wi-Fi or you are connected to your phone with the hotspot? Is connected through LAN, sir. I ask him not to open the video because uh, there is a, a issue it's of fine. internet connectivity. Yeah, but LAN normally will not defy. LAN uh, is better than uh, Wi Fi. And MBRI has good uh, LAN facility. He is not able to connect, I think. We tried to call him. Yeah, Can uh, in some office uh, tell me whether uh, this WebEx uh, uh, time is uh, limited uh, and automatically it will cut off at 3.30 or whether it is uh, hired for the day? Uh, yes, sir. Since we are live on YouTube, it will end at uh, the time limit Okay, okay. at 3.30. In, in fact, we have hardly seven minutes left. Uh, he cannot, I, I just talked to him, he cannot see the slide from his end. It means yeah, that I the see. internet connectivity is very poor there. Manoj, yeah, just... internet issue there, that is the problem. He has some internet issues, that's why he is not able to connect. We have also advised him to uh, try to connect with his mobile internet. So, I, I think I, at least he can see. Yeah, yeah. Professor Singh, are you there? Oh, oh, oh. I think Dr. P.K. Singh is not there. I, I, I am there. I am audible. Yes, P.K. Singh, yes, you are yes, audible. Not... You, you better do not depend upon slides. At least you can give your audio presentation. Give us yes, a be better, audio presentation right? because you have hardly five minutes left now. Okay, so uh, so what actually I'm going to do is, so I'm saying that the, if the whole planet is dominated with the insects, uh, they are 1 billion in number. Please go to the next slide. Please go to the next slide. So this is the next slide. 
projected so, global IDP. Already projected. There is a prediction that uh, worldwide, you know, approximately over five hundred billion dollar worth, uh, you know, agricultural produce will be lost to insects and pests if they are not controlled. And in two thousand twenty one. Uh, FAO has projected that around 40% of the crop yield is lost to the pest every year. Please go to next slide. Next slide, please. So, uh, this slide shows the usage of uh, pesticides. So, India is using approximately 6 crore. Uh, kg of pesticide every year, which has actually increased to around six fold in last uh, 15 years. China is the highest user of pesticides. So, with these, actually, we protect our crops from pest. Go to next slide, please. Next slide. So, uh, crop and insects have a very different kind of relation uh, around uh, we have 300 crops and they are uh, infested by, you know, field crop insect pests and there are something like uh, 2500, uh, you know, pests and they, they belong to either field crop insect pest or post storage pest. And whenever, you know, human involved in the improvement of crop for the yield and nutrition, it invariably helps insects you know and getting good quality food and in their multiplication insects have a remarkable ability to adapt on a variety of food with water content as low as five percent and as high as the 95 percent go to the next slide please so cotton is a very resourceful crop if it is a healthy it produces uh, fiber and the seed and then seed has oil and proteinaceous seed cake meal. And uh, we grow cotton in around, uh, you know, three crore acre land in India. In states like Punjab, a good cotton farmer spends something like 20,000 rupees per acre, produces 10 quintal cotton uh, from an acre, and then spends around uh, 8,000 rupees in harvesting, sell the produce at a price uh, of uh, 60,000 rupees, 6,000 rupees a quintal, and earns a profit like 32,000 rupees in, in, from acre in a season. But this situation doesn't exist everywhere in the country. The crops are damaged very badly. Next. So we work on the development of insect defense in cotton. Next slide, please. So, I'm showing here the four, uh, eight major insect pests of cotton in this slide. Helcoverpa, Ideas, Spodoptera, Whitefly, Pectinophora, Jesseids, Thrips, Millibug. So, there are so many insects on cotton. Next slide, please. So, as far as Bulgar 2 cotton, which is grown in the country, they are actually uh, Tolerant to two insect pests, one is Helcoverpa armigera and second is Areas vitella. Next slide, please. What we target, we, we target to control Spodoptera, Whitefly, and Pink Ballworm, Pectinophora gossypiella. So these are our targets. Today's talk is focused around Whitefly. Next slide, please. So, this shows that uh, white fly is a global pest, you know, across the world it is found and on variety of crops like Ponsitia, tomato, different kind of vegetables, beans, cotton, eggplant, so variety of plants across the you know, world and it causes, you know, yield loss over a billion US dollar, high humidity, greenhouse agriculture, high density plantation, high temperature, nitrogen rich soil and all these things actually are promoting the multiplication of this insect. Next slide, please. So, for a general audience, I have tried to compare it with a mosquito. So, this white fly actually irritates the plant, feeds on nutrition rich sap, excrete a lot of sugary honeydew and then honeydew invites a lot of growth of uh, sooty mold and it spreads plant viral diseases. Next slide, please. 
so this slide shows how you know badly uh, a cotton is damaged a b a to d photograph are cotton how the cotton crop is badly damaged you can see growth of sooty mold and then curling of leaves uh, viral symptoms e and d are representing tomato that how the tomato is infected by white fly here damage is caused by the virus it vectors and in figure f you see very small leaves which shows the extreme symptoms of viral disease. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the cloud of white fly in sub-Saharan Africa. So this shows the, you know, the aggressiveness of this insect pest. Next slide, please. So in from 2015, white flies caused the, the great loss of cotton production in North India. It was covered widely in newspaper. Next slide, please. So this slide shows, you know, the severity of white flies. So white fly is present in thousands in numbers. And you can see there, you know, the X and nymph also present, which would take over in future. So this insect actually presents so high number on cotton actually damages the insect very badly. Next slide, please. So, uh, so in when the white fly was colonized in mid of the season people farmers of punjab spread uh, 50 million us pesticides worth uh, us 50 million us dollar but actually it could not control the insect crop has to be removed uh, in mid season and it caused uh, you know the yield loss worth uh, 4700 crore rupees and a total of 17 farmers committed suicide uh, in this year in Punjab region. Next slide, please. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say that white fly cannot be controlled with pesticides if colonized on its host crop uh, perfectly. Known insecticidal proteins are not efficacious to white fly. GM crop tolerant to white fly could not be developed. So we explored plant biodiversity to address this problem and discovered a few proteins that can control white fly. Next slide, please. So uh, this shows the strategy. So uh, we, we have a good fern house from where actually we get a lot of small plants like ferns and mosses. And we get some plants from Pachmari. We So these plants are never attacked by white fly. White fly doesn't like feeding on these plants. So we prepared total soluble protein and performed bioassay and selected those total soluble proteins which caused 100% mortality. So we were looking for a protein which can cause toxicity to white fly. So we treated uh, the total soluble protein with proteinase K and we also gave thermal treatment separately and conducted the bioassay. So a, frac, a, a plant extract which shows 50% uh, toxicity uh, to white fly and uh, the toxicity was abolished when treated with proteinase K and you know at, at the thermal treatment. We selected those fractions for the purification of protein because this test actually confirmed that the causative agent, toxic causative agent in the preparation is a protein which got denatured either with proteinase K or at thermal treatment or in the both the treatment. Next slide, please. So here I am just showing the strategy. So we prepare total soluble protein and then you fractionate the protein uh, with ammonium sulfate. And we kept on doing insect bioassay in which actually we develop artificial diet. We mix the protein in diet and allow white flies to feed. So it get piercing kind of feeling, which is required for its feeding. And in this way, we uh, got some fraction which had insecticidal activity. And that, you know, fraction we took forward for the purification and we purified a few proteins. Next slide, please. So uh, in this endeavor, we discovered something like uh, 254 plants. There were L extracts of 11 plants were positive, were promising. So we purified uh, proteins, five proteins from five plants. And this story is about Tecteria macrodonta. 
from where we purify the protein. We named it as TMA12. Tacteria is an edible fern. It is found in Madhya Pradesh and of India and Nepal. It is consumed as vegetable and salad. Its concoction is traditionally used in the treatment of gastric elements. Next slide, please. I'm just rushing. So we, 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 we purify, we extracted the protein from leaf and also from rhizome of the fern. And we devised, a, you, know, con, con, you know, optimize the condition where we are able to extract uh, proteins, uh, which is toxic to whitefly without extracting all the proteins from the plant. So we did this. Uh, B section, uh, figure B shows that we re enriched the protein with help of ammonium sulfate. So proteins were sorted out and in 60 to 80 percent fraction, we got uh, maximum insecticidal activity. The protein was purified on ion exchange column, which is shown in figure C. And we got a peak which has an insecticidal activity. And then when we resolve this peak on SDS page, we found that this protein is almost 75% uh, pure. And then uh, we pur purified further this protein, this fraction on size exclusion column, and we got homogeneously purified protein. Next slide, please. So we characterized, we found this protein in present in single isoform. It existed as a diamer. LC50 of this protein to white fly is 1.5 microgram per ml. It showed perfect linearity in toxicity. We also found that uh, at sublethal doses, this protein interferes with the reproductive pathways of white fly, and the protein is found exclusively toxic to white fly. Next slide, please. We do not know whether what is the sequence of this protein. So uh, to you know know the sequence of this protein, we digested the protein with trypsin, got several peptides, and we started you know fragmenting the you know peptide on mass spectrometer for the determination of sequence. In uh, this uh, uh, on left side in sequencing method where we followed a standard method of fragmentation. The peptide is uh, fragmented from the both the ends, which we call it as the B ion and I ions, and uh, the data becomes very confusing. Finally, a computer selects few peptides. We made degenerate primer and try to clone the gene. It did not work. Then we move to you know another chemistry where uh, you know B ions and terminal ions were blocked with uh, SPITC. And only C terminus ion or Y ions were allowed to enter in the top tube. That gave you know clear you know peaks, and from there we resolved some of the we we learned the sequence of some of the peptides. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, we we uh, finally we, we made degenerate primer again and clone the gene, we found uh, this gene of uh, 651 base pair encodes a protein of 216 amino acids, and uh, the pro uh, 25 amino acid from n terminus is processed, and you get 192 amino acid mature protein. Next slide, please. So we crystallize, we do not know uh, what is this protein. We crystallize this protein, and we found that this protein is a lytic polysaccharide monooxygenase. It has two intramolecular disulfide bonds. And uh, at end terminal, there is a histidine. Histidine binds to one copper. And then to this copper, uh, a, a total of eight amino acid uh, residues are involved in an interaction. And this form a histidine brace kind of a structure. Uh, at the end terminus. This is a, a, a glycosylated protein. It has a glycosyl unit at asparagine 134. Next slide, please. Uh, when we published this paper, there was, a public, there was a subsequent publication from Nature Plant, and they have predicted that the TMA gene 
has actually moved to Tacteria macrodonta from microbial system. Uh, in microbes, this enzyme is involved in di digestion of the complex carbohydrates. Although uh, TMA12 and microbial LPMOs, they show only 38% uh, homology, but they are perfectly superimposable. Uh, function of TMA12 uh, in Tacteria macrodonta, the fern, is yet to be elucidated. Next slide, please. So uh, the slide was made for a general audience that, you know, the gene was taken from Tacteria macrodonta. Promoters were taken from Arabidopsis. We developed agrobacterium. We introduced the construct in agrobacterium. And from agrobacterium, the, the gene was introduced in cotton. Next slide, please. And we develop a total of 75 uh, transgenic quarter lines with various kind of promoter. And then we finally selected four events. And at the end, we have selected two events, which I will be showing in subsequent slide. GM cotton shows you can see presence of lot of white fly. And you can see the colony of white fly on leaf in uh, slides below the leaf, where you can see uh, X and nymphs in abundance. You know, GM cotton had very few white fly, very few X and nymphs, and uh, non-GM cotton actually got white fly infection and subsequent viral disease, growth of sooty mold. So the plant got retarded, produced lesser number of balls as compared to GM cotton, which produced good number of balls. Next slide, please. So uh, we screened uh, several, we grew several plants in polyhouse and we've conducted three experiments. One, that uh, analysis of uh, expression of gene at the transcript level, the analysis of uh, expression at the protein level by immunoassay. And we also counted uh, white fly on different GM cotton lines. And we found a total of nine lines, which could actually restrict the number of white fly to a substantially low level. And we found reasonably good uh, correlation in the gene expression in the RNA level, protein level, and white fly tolerance. And uh, barring a few exceptions, like line number 41 had a very poor, not a good expression at the transcript level, but at, a pro at a protein level, it has a good expression. So barring few exceptions, there was a good correlation in the gene expression and protection from white fly. Next slide, please. So we, we challenged uh, white fly uh, caught GM cotton and non-GM cotton with virulent white flies. And we found that you can see there was there is no symptom of white fly uh, on GM cotton. And you can see leaf curling in uh, non-GM cotton. It is because of the multiplication of, uh, it is because of virus infection and multiplication of virus in the cotton cells. Next slide, please. So we did molecular detection of uh, presence of virus in GM and non-GM cotton. We found uh, virus DNA in GM cotton, and uh, I, which was completely absent in uh, non-GM cotton. Next slide, please. So uh, you know, uh, at the at the maturity, GM cotton produced good number of cotton balls. And in case of non-GM cotton, some of the GM non-GM cotton actually could not survive due to heavy white fly predation, followed by growth of sooty mold. And remaining plant actually become photosynthetically very active and develop viral disease, but did not develop the ball because the season was over. Next slide, please. So uh, here I'm showing a slide which uh, tells you the yield protection in GM cotton line. This is a uh, plant in T3 generation. You can see lush green uh, GM cotton lines. And below you see the productivity of GM cotton. It is uh, very high as compared to uh, control cotton. And out, there are several lines which actually showed high protection, you know, and uh, protection from white fly and high yield. 
but eventually we selected uh, two events event 402 and 403 and uh, other events we are keeping we are going ahead with these two events next slide please so we did a uh, characterization of uh, integration of uh, tdna determination of site of integration of tmr12 in cotton genome so uh, in case of event 403 gene was introduced in genome in chromosome d8 and uh, in this integration process uh, no uh, you know uh, sequence of the cotton genome was lost in from tdna a few base pairs were deleted uh, in case of event 403 a few base pairs of the cotton genome was lost and a few base pair from tdna was lost but in this process uh, no cotton gene was found affected in both the lines and in insertion did not generate any allergenic polypeptide in our protein in the gm cotton this work was done by in silico analysis next slide please so we performed a safety ID, a study at uh, Central Drug Research Institute, Lucknow. We fed uh, rat at a dose uh, 10.35 milligram per kg per day. This dose is equivalent to 450 gram GM cotton seeds, seed cake meal, fed to a calf of 60 kg on daily basis. We did not find any symptomatic change in any organ of uh, rat. There was uh, this protein was not seen in plasma, urine, and fecal matter. Next slide, please. So, what at present we are doing? We 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 have introduced the G. We have selected a few lines in cocker, and from cocker, uh, which is a non-cultivated variety, we have integrated the tDNA in uh, a popular cotton variety. F2228. It is a very popular variety in Punjab, and these plants are in BC2 F1 states. Next slide, please. So here I am concluding my talk that white fly toxic protein TMA12 is isolated from an edible form. It happened to be a lytic polysaccharide monooxygenase. We have produced TMA12 in cotton and selected a few GM cotton lines for variety development. GM cotton line shows. Significant tolerance against white fly and viral disease vectored by it. GM cotton interferes with the reproduction of white fly and keeps the insect population in check. Insecticidal protein does not cause any symptomatic change in the biology of rat at sub chronic doses. Selected GM cotton are under evaluation at white flies hotspot in Punjab and Haryana by uh, PAU Ludhiana and CICR Nagpur. In parallel, selected GM line has been integrated in a popular cotton variety in Punjab, of Punjab, that is F2228. Next slide, please. So, what we aim? Uh, we aim to stack uh, three, uh, you know, transgenic cotton lines. So, uh, Cry1 EC line is available uh, from several sources, including the one available uh, at uh, South Campus with Professor Deepak Pentel's group. Uh, Monsanto Cry1 AC cotton is also available. And it has these cotton, one of these cotton lines will have to be stacked with Cry1 EC that was developed by Dr. Thuli when he was in NBRI. And then TMA12 cotton that we have developed. Recently, we have found that Cry1 EC cotton is not only efficacious to Spodoptera, it is also efficacious to pinball worm. So we are aiming to stack all three GM cotton lines in one uh, variety, which will show resistance against five insect pests. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, institute where uh, we work. This is a team of uh, plant molecular biology, plant breeding, and uh, plant physiology. So we are celebrating somebody's birthday. Next slide, please. So here I acknowledge the CSIR for funding and uh, I acknowledge uh, students and the staff of NBRI, CDRI, CMAP who helped uh, in crystallization of this protein. 
Dr. Prema Vasudev and uh, her team, CDRI helped in limited biosafety study. Uh, CICR Nagpur and Punjab Education University, Ludhiana, uh, they are evaluating our GM cotton at the hot spots. The preliminary indication result shows that our plant will sustain tol will be will show tolerance against the white fly present in hot spot. Also, uh, acknowledge Professor Omkar who did a uh, study with the not target pest. We have published uh, this around 70% of this work in general biosciences, in nature biotechnology, and in planta. And I thank you all for patient hearing. My apology for uh, creating a mess while presentation. <laughs> and then finally, I rushed the presentation very, very fast. Hey, thank, thank you very much, much uh, Dr. Pika Singh. If I may quickly take over, you know, since uh, we had to utilize uh, the tea break uh, for helping you finish your talk, and uh, the technology conflict uh, did happen, but you overtook it uh, quite well. Thank you very much for your. Uh, presentation which really uh, reflected how a very well thought out problem uh, through fairly large collaboration has progressed very successfully. So I may first uh, uh, request if uh, you would be happy to take up some questions from the audience in next two sure. minutes, three minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so so shall I stop sharing the slide or after the questions I'll do? I think the slides are okay, PK Singh. She can, they yeah, can yes. uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Thanks very yeah. much. Thank you, Insa. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Any specific that, questions? Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Dr. Tuli, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, uh, re with regard to morphology of the TMA fuel uh, transgenic cotton, mm -hmm. were there any differences in morphology or was it same as compared to non, non GM? It is absolutely okay. same, sir. Absolutely same. Absolutely same. There is no problem. So yeah. we had developed several 75 transgenic lines. Yeah. And many had uh, many problems, but uh, the line we selected, it hadn't any problem. Both the lines hadn't any problem. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So your, your reply to Dr. Rajan's question is based on uh, a fairly yeah. uh, Multiple generations and uh, yeah, size of population. Yeah. yeah, it is based on my observation for six generations. Good, good, yes. good. Yeah. Uh, followed by you know mm. examining the BC one to BC four plants at PAU. And Marple is absolutely same. Absolutely same, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other query, please? Uh, in the council uh, says Dr. Sampadas had some question. Yeah. Would in the council uh, put up that question if uh, if it is there? The, the mechanism. Uh, so the question is, yeah. um, what, what is the mechanism behind reduction of viral transmission in GM cotton? Uh, it is very straightforward. Uh, uh, you know, if you control vector, you will control you know the pathogen. You know, so it is very simple. I I don't think TMA twelve has any role in inhibiting replication of virus in plant, it is the control of vector which is actually offering virus protection. So white fly is a carrier of viruses and right. uh, that's how it gets controlled. Yeah. Any other question, please? What about the other paste in uh, cotton? Uh, there we there are uh, a total of 15 uh, insect pests uh, on cotton. Seven are very, eight are very serious. We are addressing uh, five insect pests. BT cotton addresses two insect pests, Helcoverpa and Armigera. This technology will address the problem of uh, white fly. And then uh, when Dr. Tuli was uh, faculty and director at NBRI, he had developed Cry1 EC cotton that addresses two additional insect pests. One is pink ball worm and second is Spodoptera. So we want to club pyramid all three uh, events uh, uh, in one. So we can have, you know, uh, protection against five insect pests, but it is far-fetched dream. And TMA2 has specific to only 
white fly no other insect right specific to white fly only in uh, uh, response to dr chakravarty's question dr pk singh you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, that lpmo like activity but mm -hmm. uh, it is a chitinolytic activity uh, also it carries so i do not know now uh, which of the two activities is important for control of white fly but then uh, what dr supriya asked is that if it is chitinolytic one doesn't know that uh, you know cuticle uh, in epidermis in trachea in gut epithelium you know, they have this uh, chitin scaffold so one doesn't know if any other arthropods or even fungi may be inhibited uh, uh, by tm12 only more extensive uh, so, testing may, may may tell that is that right can i reply yeah yeah please go ahead yeah in, in case of uh, you know uh, microbial lpmos you, you get two types of activity one is uh, cellulolytic activity and second is cartinolytic activity. Cellulolytic activity is predominant. In case of TMA12, cartinolytic activity is predominant and cellulolytic activity is less. So we feel that uh, TMA12 interferes in the biology of white fly through cartinolytic activity. We have taken up a few experiments to, res to address this problem, but uh, it is too early to make comment on this. Yeah, I think if I may say uh, with this question, thank you very much, Dr. P.K. Singh. We are very grateful that besides the challenge uh, of technology, you can make, make it uh, yeah. uh, very well, so well. And on behalf of INSA, on behalf of our section committee, on my personal behalf, you know, we thank uh, both uh, both the wonderful speakers who covered two very important areas uh, in agriculture. We are very happy that uh, our fellowship broadly got exposed to the work being done by relatively recently introduced fellows into distinct areas of activity in agriculture. Thank you very much and all the Thank very best. We are already Thank very you. late. We have only four minutes for the next uh, for the next talk to begin by Professor T. R. Sharma, which as you know is Bilgrami Special Award Lecture. So may I you, request that we leave and uh, uh, we thank INSA Council for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir. Thank, thank, you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All the best to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.